Today I want to take a look at repairing a vintage calculator from 1977 that I just recently picked up. This is a Unisonic 21. Now one of the things that makes the Unisonic 21 unique is, well, it doesn't exactly look like a calculator, does it? Sure, it has the usual operators over here, but we have play and some interesting keys on this side. Well, the 21 is also a blackjack machine. Interestingly enough, the only other desktop Unisonic calculator I have is also a clock. So it seems that they really like to add additional features to their calculators. From 1977, the Unisonic 21 really looks like a cheap garbage <laughs> uh, device. It does not ooze quality in any form at all. The plastic is cheap, it weighs nothing, there's very little on it, and the bright colors just... Yeah, they don't make it stand out in a good way. Now, unfortunately, this example here is not working. If I load it up with some batteries, it does absolutely nothing when you try and turn it on. So, at some point, something went a bit wrong with this thing. Now, I have had far from the best luck when it comes to picking up unisonic calculators. That clock one I showed you earlier... Yeah, the calculator portion of that does not work because an IC died in it. And that's not even the only other dead Unisonic I have. I have this small portable Unisonic calculator that has some uh, pretty bad power delivery problems. Yeah, that might get its own video one day, but for now we're going to focus on the Unisonic 21. Since it does absolutely nothing when power is applied, it's probably not going to be too difficult of a problem to solve. Alright, before we open this up, let's take a guess at what the problem could be. So, first off, you might suspect that the battery contacts have been corroded by batteries left in there. Well, from what I can just barely make out of them in here, they don't look all that bad. Now, also on the back is what appears to be a power input jack, but the label is missing here that I would imagine tells you what voltage and polarity that is. There's also apparently another missing label here, so between these two, one of them could say what that was. Now it's possible someone plugged in the wrong power supply and fried something inside of here, so that could be it. This plastic is also not exactly inspiring. Pretty cheap and flexible. This part's metal though, that's kind of nice. But there could be a broken piece of plastic in here that was holding in one of the battery terminals or something to that effect. So. That could also be a problem. And then it could just be that the calculator or blackjack device is working and maybe a flex circuit going to the display is not. So we have a couple of things to troubleshoot here. Now, I don't know what the voltage going into the uh, power jack here is supposed to be. And I do actually have another Unisonic calculator that I did get with the power supply. So. That jack does appear to be the same, but there is a problem. This calculator takes three batteries, and this one takes four. And the rated power supply voltage is six volts, which makes me think that they're using this just as a substitute for batteries. So probably wouldn't be the best idea to put it in here. This one's probably rated to 4.5 volts. Adding more credence to that theory, the other broken Unisonic calculator also has the same DC input jack, but is rated to 3 volts when having only two battery spaces. So yeah, the Unisonic 21 is probably 4.5 volts. Alright, well, let's crack this open and see what we've got going on. Uh, this thing has some super tiny deep set screws in here, so this screwdriver is just the only thing I've got that'll reach. It's really annoying. Man, those screws did not want to cooperate. Okay, so there is not a whole lot going on here for power. The positive terminal, I assume that these are color-coded correctly, is going over and connected to the main board, it looks like, and the black terminal negative goes over to the power jack and is piggybacked with the blue wire, which is connected to the circuit board. Now, this is uh, pretty cleverly designed here, so this is the logic board and the display board crammed in there at an angle 
with contacts going down to the cheaper key switch board. <laughs> that's, that's pretty clever. So I can't really see much on here. This blue wire has a little bit of discoloration, but it seems like it's attached okay. It's coming through, it's fine. The red wire also seems pretty good. So signs are not pointing towards just general problems getting the power to the board. It looks like something on the board may have failed. So I'm gonna have to take this out, which means I'm going to have to unscrew this since this is soldered directly into it. Man, this thing is really confusingly assembled. It turned out removing the keypad board wasn't necessary, although we will still, because there's some interesting stuff going on in there, and I'm curious what the key switches are. But anyway, we can get in here, we can see the main IC here, and there's just one, so that does both the calculator function and the blackjack function, and I can find uh, nothing about that, so... Yeah, but we can see that it is from the 33rd week of 1977, so this is probably an original production run example of this calculator. Now, there isn't a whole lot on this board. Um, these are the only two other real components on here, and they look fine. We have what I think is some kind of inductor or transformer here. I can just barely see some windings inside, so I don't know if that could possibly be shorted or not, but... Yeah, there's not a whole lot to diagnose on here, so we're going to have to start doing some probing to figure out what's going where. But let's take a look at the key switches first, because I'm always fascinated by that, because it was there was no standard at this point, so everyone who did this solved the problem for the first time themselves. Wow, all right, this is yet again another type of key switch that I have not seen. So, we have the circuit board here with a couple of contacts around a center contact for every key switch, and you can see these little ghosted areas. Well, the contacts are actually just these separate pieces that are resting in here. Guess how I found out those aren't connected? Yeah. Um, and the center of every single key is held up by a spring and then has a little rubber tip in there that just presses down on the center, causing it to lift and make contact with the circuit board, shorting the two connected pads. So, wow, yeah, totally different than anything else I've ever seen, <laughs> and in no way better than any of the other ones. I'm really shocked why they did this. The unisonic calculator I showed from 1972 had a weird dual spring system that made contact, and I can't see how this is better or cheaper to produce than that. I also like how their method for maintaining vertical alignment for the taller keys is to just add more springs in there. No, we don't need alignment shafts. Just stick some more springs in there. It'll all even out eventually. Well, I was thinking there was a possibility that the contacts for the power switch could be bad, but really these actually look quite good. The pads on the circuit board are fine and shiny and really not all that worn out from being used, and this looks pretty good as well. This is These are made of so many tiny parts. Oh, man, it's... <laughs> taking that out sucks. But no, this this is not a problem, so that's unfortunate. But pulling the keys off of here was useful. On the other side, I had actually traced ground as going to one of these pins, I believe it was this one, and this does just go all the way over to the power switch, gets shorted here, and then makes a return trip directly back. So, 
Now I can tell where ground is coming from on the main board because it is this pin right here. So this was still useful. Okay, I've got some batteries in here and we can see the voltage is getting through the contacts on there. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's going on on here. So the uh, negative does go through the blue wire here and then comes over to this point and that is connected to the board. So what I've done is I've just taken a little binder clip and shorted out the power switch with a little bit of solder braid. So this, uh, ooh man, this thing here. So power does make it onto the circuit board and it does go off to some places like there and over to the barrel jack, which does let us know that putting the six volt power supply into this would have been a bad idea. Now, this goes off to the uh, the weird thing up here that I'm not really sure about. What do we got here? CV-010. Hmm. Let me see if I can look that up and find anything. No, nothing good comes from that search. So, uh, well, I do know slightly what it's doing. It is a step up negative voltage generator so we can measure the output in some places as getting pretty high negative 36 volts which kind of makes sense for the vfd we have in here now it is just a little more than that though because all the way over on the chip uh, we unfortunately have negative voltages going into that which means it is a negative logic chip so that's not going to be fun to diagnose now uh, from here, I start to lose confidence in this repair. So, where to go from here seems unclear because I am seeing negative voltages getting over here. So, it's not a lack of power. Power is being distributed through the board. I mean, I can see there are some negative higher voltages there. I can probe on what's going on on these, yeah. So, there's there's voltage getting places. So, it's not a power distribution problem. After removing the batteries, I can go through and test every diode on the board and see that those are all looking pretty good as well. So it's not a shorted or blown diode somewhere, unfortunately. That would have been nice. Now the legs over here on the transistors next to the voltage generator are looking a bit black, but I'm pretty sure they're insulated, not burnt out like the Casio CQ1 was. And since these are different part numbers, I'm pretty sure these are going to be more importantly rated than the other ones, unless they were just grabbing stuff off the floor. You can look one of these up and see what they are. But I did measure what was coming off of the pins, and it didn't seem unusual to me, so I think these are running fine. And before everyone goes crying capacitors, this is before the capacitor plague, so the capacitors are probably fine, especially seeing as there are no leaking or bulging ones on the board. I don't have any real reason to suspect these. Well, like with the last Unisonic, I'm kind of stuck here thinking the chip itself has gone bad. There's not a lot I can do here. Um, it could be the VFD, but the VFD is actually mounted with these really nice rubber shock mounts. It's very well secured in there. This ghosting pattern, that's not a problem. The VFD itself is a really nice uh, Futuba one, it's, if I readjust the focus here. So I don't think that that is the problem. Now I could just try and give in and replace the capacitors on here just to see what happens, but I still don't think that's it. Uh, and they're kind of unusual values, so I'm guessing this one's 0.47 microfarads at 50 volts. It probably is on the negative 37 volt line coming out of this thing, and this one is 33 and 10, so it, they're... They're pretty unusual ratings, and this one's 10 and 50, so yeah, I'm not going to have the easiest time uh, getting these now, and really a parts order's not worth it for one of these calculators. They aren't worth all that much, so it's not the most critical thing that I get this particular one working again. And really, the calculators that I collect, I try to find something unique about them, and this one does not have a unique display, just being vacuum fluorescent, and... Blackjack really isn't actually all that uncommon for calculators in this time, so it's not that unique to this either, and really this one's kind of low quality. So, 
Uh, I, I don't know how much more effort it's really worth trying to put into saving this. Uh, I don't like to do this, but I am going to yield on this thing and just kind of give up on it. There's only three things to really go wrong on here. The VFD, the chip, and the high voltage generator circuit. And I think I'm getting voltages out of this. And this looks fine and is extremely well secured on here. Which leads me to think it's just the IC. And there's nothing I can do about that. Here I am getting ready to wrap this up, and I figure I'll chuck the batteries in one more time and see what happens. Did you see it? Because something did happen. Here, let me help. It is almost sort of working. Alright, if I turn it on, you can just barely see some of the digits light up in there, and I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. Let me type in something though. That's obviously working, but it's extremely faint. I have the camera set up just right here for you to be able to see that, but in person it is very difficult to see. Now it only seems to want to do anything in calculator mode. If I set it to blackjack mode and hit play, I don't see anything happen. The digits flash in the back there, but I can't see anything going on don't know what the manual for this would tell me to do. I don't have it. I haven't searched for one. Might be out there, but yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, did that just show a number? I okay, bet. It, I don't know. See, this is, there's nothing showing up, but if I put it to calculator, clear, you know, I do 80, that, let's say, plus, um, uh, that didn't work. Hmm. Okay. Plus, it blinked, so it registered it. Nope. Equals, yeah. So something's... Ooh, man, something's not right here. Okay, all of a sudden, now it's behaving more rationally. So if we clear this, 888 eight, eight plus 111 one, one equals 999, which is obviously what it should be. The blackjack mode still doesn't seem to want to work right. Whoa, that's, there's something seriously wrong there. Um, so, yeah, uh, but yeah, let's, let's get it back open and measure voltages and stuff, because now we're actually getting somewhere with this. Okay, I found a manual that explains, uh, blackjack, and it's, it does look like it's working. So if I clear here, we'll get... Um, over here is a zero. It's really hard to see. I'm going to put in a five as my bet. And now I can play. Or do I hit? It was, ah, this is confusing. Here we go. Okay, so I got a nine. It got a face card, and now I'm at 16, I guess. Um, I don't know. Play. Nope. It doesn't work. It's so weird. Dealing. Do, do, do. Yeah, so I want to stand. Here we go. So it did 14 plus, oh, so F is a face card. So it did 24, so they bust, I win. Okay, so play. No, play. Okay, I guess I have to bet again. I don't know how much I, or how I see my purse. Um. Okay, so... I got uh, 14, so I'm going to hit. Ah, uh, 24, I bust. Okay. This is, it's working. Okay. So, we just need to fix the display brightness, which, ooh, man, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, that's not going to be easy. All right, so an inconsistent VFD definitely makes me think there could be something wrong with the high voltage generation circuit. So this, I believe, is either an inductor or a transformer, so it's probably not ever going to change, which means these two components are the most likely suspects for problems. Now the C620 here, I found a modern equivalent of it looks like, and it's a relatively high voltage transistor. I do not have one of those on hand at the moment. Let me look up the C711 and see if any of what I have is compatible with that. 
that one is an even higher voltage transistor. Okay. And that's pretty high current, too. 100 milliamps? Jeez. Uh, yeah, those, uh, I might, I could probably find those, but, you know, it's, I still have to go out and get them. So, let's see if there's any way for me to check if those are working correctly. Well, I can't make up my mind, but I'm kind of thinking now that the uh, transistors aren't the problem. I'm going with the caps now. First off, I could get a replacement for the C620 uh, locally. I could get that today. I can't find one for the C711 easily. I, I could probably find one online if I looked around, but I don't really think this calculator is worth placing an online order, so I may just not bother. But anyway, the capacitors, um, apparently track on sucks, so... Yeah, that's probably it. So I'm going to pull off a couple of these, I guess, and we'll measure with my ESR meter to see if that is the problem. Now, I went ahead and pulled out my big bin of capacitors that I've pulled from other stuff or just have around. Anyway, I don't have any capacitors that are that high a voltage range. Everything is really low. I mean, look at this 2.5 volts. Um, that one I don't think actually says might be 6.3 volts. Uh, what we got on this one? 16 volts. Yeah, these 50 and 30 volt capacitors on here, those are very unusual. So I will definitely have to order these online if I ever plan on doing a repair on this. I'm thinking I should just start making a list of things that I need to buy capacitors for and then just make one big order. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and pull off. Uh, well, let's, let's start with this one because it's the biggest. And see if the ESR meter can even get close to the value that it I think it should be. Because again, these aren't really well labeled. It's just two numbers with a slash in the middle. So I'm, I'm assuming that's microfarads and volts, but I don't actually know. Why would I ever doubt it being the capacitor? Yeah, that thing's toast. It's in the right microfarad range, but the ESR is horrible. So yeah, that is is the problem. So, I guess I can see if Fry's Electronics has high voltage capacitors, but ooh, man, I'm not liking my chances of that. After I found it would actually be possible to get them locally, I decided to take all of the capacitors out so I can see what values I would actually need. And after I tested every single one of these, it turned out they were all bad. So, I need to get five replacement capacitors for this thing. Now, that's somewhat of a problem for Fry's Electronics. First of all, they don't even have the 0.47 microfarad ones, so I would have to substitute those with 1 microfarad capacitors, which probably wouldn't be a problem. Um, but there's a, a, a different consideration that has to be made. Each one of the capacitors at Fry's Electronics is effectively $2. Now, $10 in its own isn't that bad, but it's kind of high. It's actually pretty high. It's really bad for capacitors. Um, but compared to the cost of the calculator, it becomes a really hard pill to swallow. Now, as of the time that I am recording this video, there is on eBay one of these calculators, new in the box, from 1977, for $16. I am $5 into the calculator I have here, so, I would just be $1 off my total cost to buy a new in-box example of one of these. So, it doesn't make sense to buy the capacitors at Fry's Electronics. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense either to just order them from, say, Mauser or DigiKey, because you'll have to pay a $5 to $7 shipping charge. It's going to come out to just about the same, even though the individual capacitors are going to be much cheaper there. So, it doesn't make economic sense to just repair this calculator. Now, in the future, when I have something else that is worth repairing, it will make sense to tack these capacitors onto that order. But I am not placing an order for anything else at the moment. So, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place here. Alright, I've got it all put back together now. And, curiously, after having taken it apart and worked on it a little bit, the numbers that do work display quite a bit brighter, but it, and it's difficult to see with your human eyes, but I can see it on the camera here. There is 
an exposure gradient or a brightness gradient. It's darker over here and it doesn't just instantly get brighter, it's very gradual. So there's definitely something analog going wrong in this, which would be the calculators. But since it's a bit brighter, we can actually sort of check this out. So the calculator functions themselves are pretty minimal. So let's do 50 divided by four equals, there we go, that's correct. So yeah, it's, you know, it's a calculator. It's not a very good calculator. We got four functions. It's pretty blah. Really the thing about this device is the blackjack capability. So let's see here. I'm going to bet five. I'm going to play. No, do I have to power it off and on again? It's really confusing. It's what you do. And it still does that, which I don't understand. But all right, let's do. Nope. Oh, clear. <laughs> all right, play. Bet five bet okay so i got a f and a five now an f is a face card jack king queen um and dealer got four and that's so difficult to see but the dealer got four so i'm at 15 i'm gonna hit bam oh sucks for me um and the dealer has eight but the dealer just the dealer wins so let's play bet Oh, okay, we're just going again, all right? Uh, I got nine hit, uh, so either 20 or, you know, 10, so I'm going to stay at uh, 20 there. He Dealer got 18, so I won because dealer draws on 16. So, yeah, blackjack works. Um, it's kind of weird that the, the little chip in there that's very specific to just this, which also I think it's funny, it has 21 in the part number. It it has this very large display, and it uses it because the player cards are over here, <laughs> but it won't use that for the calculator. The calculator digits are very restricted. Kind of strange. Also interesting, I think that you might have a uh, purse or a wallet in this. So let's see, bet, five, bet. So you do have to make, you have to place a bet. So we got 11 here, hit, ace, that's so, uh, it's 12, hit, 14, hit, ooh, bust. Now, if I'd won, I did win earlier, um, and I've tried this before, I haven't seen what you bet get added to anything, which, is confusing because it would mean that it would have to have a running accumulator in there for the um, the bla uh, blackjack component. What's weird about that is it does not have a running accumulator for the calculator. There's no mem plus or mem minus or mem recall options. It would seem to make sense that if this does have an accumulator for your score in blackjack, that you would also reuse it in the calculator function. But no, it does not. <laughs> so. It's kind of interesting. I don't know. It's unfortunate that really this device, it it is beyond economic repair, and it, it's just a shame. So I, I wish it wasn't, but really it is. It's just it doesn't make sense to order those capacitors. And even this particular example is not in the best of shape. I'm now realizing that as I was putting it back together, it, <laughs> the green piece of plastic that lets you kind of actually see what's going on in there, detached and it's just held on with good wishes so we'll have to reattach that probably with hot glue so uh yeah i'd be much much better off just buying one of these on ebay completing the box for how inexpensive they are i just I, I don't try and seek out stuff like this on ebay if i was gonna buy a vintage calculator on ebay i'd buy something much more interesting than this so these kinds of things i relegate to happening upon in thrift stores and I don't regret purchasing this one for five bucks. It does do something at least. And even if it didn't, it's an interesting piece of calculator history. And this is, this represents the cheapening of calculators. It was so inexpensive for them to produce this that they made it a game in addition to a calculator. It's not a serious business device. It is a cheap toy, which is kind of cool. So I hope you guys enjoyed this look at um, something a little bit unusual, even if it may have been a slightly disappointing diagnosis now. It's definitely not a repair. And if you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.